Why struggle through a post-merger integration when you can glide through it? Why deal with the PMI integration challenges when you can overcome them even before they occur? Why move slow when you can move at pace? What are the world's leading PMI experts doing right now to achieve profit accelerating integrations? This podcast will give you all the answers to these questions and many more. My name is Dudley Peacock and welcome to the 100 Days and Beyond podcast. Welcome everyone to the latest podcast, the latest episode in 100 Days and Beyond, the podcast that highlights the the journey the day-to-day activities and and what i call the rough and tumble of 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 the unsung heroes of those people that that are put in the throes in the middle of um, the integration phase so when we do mergers and acquisitions we often have the uh, the high flyers in the front end the deal makers doing the deals and then it's left to the uh, post-merger or post-acquisition integrators to do the work. Today we've got a, a, a really a special guest. So Craig, Craig Richardson is actually on the acquisition side and he gets involved in the integration side as an owner in different businesses. And I think that's probably the easiest way to explain it. I'm going to continue to, <laughs> Craig, I'm going to go through your bio mm-hmm. right now, but I think you, you probably see something that often many of the practitioners might not experience is a difference between being part of the ownership or ownership group, owning companies, doing integrations while you own them, trying to get them uh, in, uh, let's call it into a a strategic alignment to why you bought them in the first place. Let's quickly go through your your bio. So Craig joined uh, Dow Schofield Watts as a partner in 2006. Prior to this, he spent 14 years at KPMG undertaking corporate finance and due diligence assignments in the UK and overseas after qualifying as a chartered accountant in 1992. That's, um, that's, a, that's a bit that's a of a ago. shift. So he, uh, he has over 25 years experience advising SME owners with finance, raising, acquisition and exit. In the inaugural Northwest Insider Awards, Craig was voted Corporate Finance Advisor of the Year and Dealmaker of the Year in Lancashire. That's brilliant. I mean, we're going to need to have to talk about that. Hmm. And then Craig sits on the board of the six PhD Industrial Holdings Investments, which have a combined turnover circa about £65 million and an EBITDA of around £8 million. That's a serious company or a group of companies. He has a background in advising SME owners on growth strategy, board structure, creating capital value and succession planning and execution. And he has also lectured to leading banks on how to assess the competence of management teams, which is invaluable in his role. Welcome, Craig. Thank you. Thanks, Dudley. Yeah, Yeah, that's a fantastic... Yeah, it's a fantastic bio and uh, our conversation before the episode. Wow, I mean, I I think uh, this this will be really special episodes purely because we have we have someone that is sits on the boards, make sure that the integration happens, and sits as as a um, from an ownership perspective in, mm-hmm. in making sure that that the strategy gets fulfilled, but not with a view necessarily at, on exit. But more with a view in terms of growth and 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 so on. Um, and there's some some key points I'd like to to uh, address <laughs> about your bio. But Craig, before we get into that, uh, welcome and please tell us how did you get into this uh, this space from '92 being a chartered accountant through to <laughs> to getting into deal making. Sure, it seems a long time ago now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I suppose in some ways it's it's been a typical career in terms of. I went into a big four accounting firm, not knowing what the county was, went into audit, which most people did in those days, and uh, spent three years auditing. Um, and then our department, luckily, uh, was the department in our Preston office that did um, special work, at, 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 as it was called, which was, uh, which is now called corporate finance, M&A, due diligence, um, corporate recovery, also did tax as well. So it was a really good um, grounding um, that, that, that I had. 
And I moved into corporate finance and I thought, actually, I, I do like this. Um, I'm not saying I understood it at the start, but I, but I, I like what, what people were trying to achieve in terms of uh, most of my dealings were with SMEs and it was selling SMEs to, to public quoted companies, as well as doing some management buyouts as well. But it's mainly dealing with business owners who'd grown their businesses over the last 20 or 30 years and wanted to sell. So very much gamekeeper turned poacher because after a number of years, um, starting probably in 2012, um, I got involved in acquiring businesses for our investors. <clears throat> so when you're an advisor, it, it's great in many ways in that you advise the clients the best you can. Um, <clears throat> if there's any issues on the acquisition, you defer to the client and say, look, this is the issue. This is how I think we should deal with it. <clears throat> Excuse me. But at the end of the day, you know, it's your choice whether you want to make this acquisition or, or increase the price or do whatever you want. Now, when you're buying a business on behalf of investors, of which I'm an investor as well, suddenly you've not really got anybody to ask because advisors are coming to you. So a corporate finance advisor or, or, or probably a lawyer is coming to you and saying, look, this is the issue. This is the risk. What do you want to do about it? Now, I work with um, two other colleagues and we have a chat, we have a think, um, we've got a chairman as well, who's a very experienced corporate finance advisor in his own right. But whenever you go to him, you know, you get to a certain stage in your career and people want the answers, not a question. So it's a case of, this is the issue, what do you think? And the answer back is, well, what do you think? And, and that starts happening, that's been happening for quite a few years now. And it's both refreshing uh, you know, sometimes a bit scary thinking, crikey, I need to come up with the answer and not just be able to ask someone. Yeah. Um, let me get, uh, let me get myself back in view there. So, so that, that's interesting because I think there, there's a, comes a time and, and I'm lucky you rightfully mentioned, um, besides your, your career that's trans transitioned from accounting into corporate finance and then and into where you are right now. But there comes a time when, um, when the, uh, I would say the, the mental shift can be, can be uh, assisted by mentors, by coaches, by people that help you along the way and mm. coaches and mentors. And, 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 and you probably see this where you are right now in terms of being part of a board and so on, you would be employing new people. You'd be trying to build teams. You'd be doing a whole lot of things like that, but it's sometimes it's better instead of providing answers to, to rather provide better questions or, mm. or to push back and say, you know, I'm your sounding board. Tell me what mm. you think. And that's a much better educable moment, if you like, as opposed to trying to, to teach all the time or, or to mm. assist all the time. So tell us a bit about that, because what that, that transition, how, how long did it take from you to gain the confidence to start making your own decisions from that initial stage? It doesn't happen overnight, <clears throat> excuse me. And it's difficult to remember when it actually happened. Um, but one thing I do remember is that um, when you start off auditing and you're going into a company, so I was, I remember going into a, we did big companies, we did small companies, but there was a, one client I had in particular, only turned over one million pound. And I was going into the business owners and asking them questions about their accounts and their audit. But the problem I had, and the problem a lot of people have, I think at such a young age of, you know, 22 or whatever is, you don't actually know what you're supposed to know and what you don't know. So I was always worried that the client would be expecting me to know all the answers and I'd be afraid of what I was, what I was asking. And then you spin forward 10 years or so, and then you start to realize what you should know and what you shouldn't know. And once you know that you can confidently say, actually, <clears throat> excuse me, can you repeat that? Or can you just explain that in a different way? Cause I don't know what you're talking about. And then they, 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 they do. And I think for me, that was the aha moment about, about the, the confidence I had to, to ask the right questions and, and not be worried about whether, whether I should know those, those, those answers or not. And the, the other sort of transition um, from, from that, that's still, still advising, once you're in NED, um, you have a whole load of hats to wear, as you were saying, Dudley. It, it, you know, it's about, it's about being a coach, it's about being a mentor, it's about being an advisor. Um, and, and, and quite often, the management teams you're dealing with 
haven't had access to that. They've only had access to the owner of the business. And quite often, as you'll know, owners of businesses and entrepreneurs are often quite um, dictatorial because that that is their style. That's how they've had to. That's how they've had to grow. They're, mm. they're often self self taught. So a big transition is is about how the how the board table acts. And in fact, m- most businesses we invest in have, have never really had a board meeting. So even that's new. The, the whole concept of a board meeting and reporting uh, both both in writing and verbally. Mm. Yeah, and 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 if I if I think about um, some SMEs or SMBs or um, the the entrepreneur, let's say it's a founder entrepreneur, because sometimes it's not. Sometimes they may have acquired the business or so on. But if you take founder uh, uh, entrepreneurs and operators, what you what you have is 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 a is a uh, let's call it a a nucleus that gets formed around the owner, and it becomes a uh, the chief and many many helpers. Yeah. And when you're doing an acquisition, you sometimes have to say, okay, how do I do I take the chief out because the helpers actually won't know what to do. And that's why I'm sort of touching on that now in the beginning of our episode, because I think those are one of the big transition things that you have to deal with. You go in and you do an acquisition and that comes back down to one of your points there where you, where, where, where you talk about, um, uh, it's a, it's a, it's about looking at management teams. There we go. So it says also lectured, um, to leading, um, to leading banks on how to assess the competent competence of management teams, which is in, in, invaluable in his role. So the competence of management teams, sometimes there is no management team. Sometimes that you do have, but it's probably only one or two individuals, which are probably doing the same thing as what you were doing in the initial part of your career. And I'm going to just circle back and say, they probably going back to the chief with many helpers and saying, mm-hmm. what do I do with this? What do I do with that? Um, and, 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 and there's this, there's not enough pushback. And now you mm-hmm. come in, you do the acquisition. This is a cultural shift, isn't it? I mean, if you look uh, at that, I mean, tell us a little yeah. bit about, about that shift. Yeah, absolutely. I think that the two, to be to have a successful business, you've got to have a successful business model and you've got to have a, a successful or a good management team. And I, I probably look at about a thousand companies a year and we probably invest in one or two, maybe. Most of them are uninvestable. Um, some of them, um, they don't fit our criteria. And then there's a small band that we really like that then we've got to negotiate the price and whatever. The, the issue we have though, is that Quite often, before you buy a business, the only access you have is to um, the the owner who's probably going to leave, and they won't give you access to the management team. Quite rightly, because they think, well, if you don't complete this acquisition, I've got to tell them. I've got to tell them why. So that is the the trickiest thing in making an acquisition: um, assessing the management team you're going to inherit, or indeed, if there isn't a management team, as you as you alluded to, Dudley, um, what is the gap? What's the void going to be and how are we going to fill it when the owner leaves uh, and, and what's the culture like? So that is the biggest risk to us. We can assess mm. the business model because we can do due diligence, financial due diligence, legal due diligence. We can do some market due diligence and we only invest in businesses that we understand um, so that we can touch and feel um, as opposed to technology or, or, or thing widgets that go into some other process that we, we can't we can't assess. So we like to keep things simple, but going back to the culture, it's just so difficult. Ideally, we'd we'd like access to the senior management team. And in fact, nowadays, it's rare that we do an acquisition without having access to the senior management team because it's just too risky. We've done it in the Mm -hmm. past. We've we've bought 100% of businesses without meeting uh, the management team because we weren't allowed. And then we've recruited management teams. And that's harder. It's always better if you've got a management team already there. But even with the yeah. management team already there, they're very much coached by the um, by the owner and by the 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 the, um, the owner's advisor as well about what the management team can say and can't say because of course they're still employed by the the owner and they're not sure whether the acquisition's going to go ahead or not. So that that's um, that's very tricky for us. Um, culture is very difficult and quite often. Um, you've got to you've got there's, there's got to be a bit of a leap of faith when you buy an mm-hmm. when you buy a company 
And part of that leap, that leap of faith should get smaller and smaller as time goes on, as you get more experience, because you get to know what, where the pitfalls probably are. So one thing we do to mitigate um, the effect of the owner leaving is making sure that we only acquire businesses where um, the, the, the biggest customer is no more than five, six, seven percent of the turnover, such that if that customer disappeared, it, 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 it would be a bit of a nightmare, but it wouldn't it wouldn't really affect the business um, catastrophically. So the, the biggest lesson I had in that was was many years ago when I was advising a company and they were providing services to a larger company. And there were six businesses in the UK that provided these services. And I was acting for the seller, one of these six business partners, as they called them. Um, but, but most of their turnover was to this particular customer about 50% actually. And I said to the, to, the, um, to the owner, what happens if that customer decides to use somebody else? And they said, well, that won't happen. And I said, why is that? Because we've got such a really good relationship with the buyer. We go on holiday with them, we're family friends. Now you can guess what happened. Next time the contract was up for renewal uh, and they were the best performing business partner in the UK as well. Mm -hmm. However, what, what the client didn't know, what nobody knew was that the larger company, they needed to rationalize their supplier base from six to three and unfortunately whilst this one was the best performing one and they were personal friends um there was an there was another supplier that that did two other key areas and it made sense economically for them to do this one so so that taught me never to invest in and we, we didn't i was an advisor on that so it didn't affect me um it affected the client um but what it taught me was never to invest in a business that's wholly reliant on on um on one or two customers um and and, and the reason why i mentioned in that is because we're, we're interviewing, doing due diligence with the business owner and the business owner is, also, is obviously telling us everything that's great about the business and all the relationships. They, are, they always say, I don't do much in the business now. When you ask them a the question, what do you do? Oh, I don't do much. I have loads of holidays. <laughs> I hardly come in. Um, X, Y, and Z deal with everyone. Um, and and that, is, that is really hard to, to judge. Uh, and and the, other, the other interesting example we had, we, we acquired a business once and it didn't go particularly well. Um, and the reason for that is um, the the guy who owned it, he his role was quite a sundry role. It was it was operations, and it was quite a simple role in a way. And the, the key role was selling that his business partner had, who was who was a minority shareholder, and he wanted to buy the the other guy out. Um, so we thought, well, actually, if if the ops guy goes, it doesn't matter because it's just logistics. Somebody else can do that, which was true. Somebody else could do that. But what we hadn't realized was the, the majority shareholder, he instilled the culture on all the employees. Um, and we just failed to, to realize that um, all the sales guys, they weren't driven by the sales guy who we were backing. They were driven by the cultural, the, the, the culture that the, 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 the majority um, owner instilled. So that was another learning as well. And, and, and finally, um, even post acquisition, uh, we've got to be careful to make sure that we don't only see um, the directors and the management team, because the, you only know what you know and you don't know what you don't know. So if all we're doing, and, and COVID was a bit of an issue sometimes, because we just had teams meetings with the with the two or three or four senior members of the management team, and we couldn't actually go and speak to people and you know when when you're wandering around i'm not suggesting we do a factory tour every time we go to a company every month but you just still see people and you just notice things yeah and i and i think that um if you if you look at sales and marketing um as a let's call it a work stream or as a particular operational um, or a, a part of the of the business often when you have a relationship with uh, i've you know if let's say I have, um, I've got a customer and they are one of the big, I've, I'm an SME. I've got a big customer, they a, a large chain or they listed entity, but I in fact only know one person in that 20,000 employee company and they buying from me because they like me and I'm, they're my mates and I've been mm -hmm. working with them for 20 years, but mm -hmm. the other 19,999 employees don't know who I am. Mm -hmm. Now you've got an SME servicing this client and often it's, 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 um, it, <laughs> it's quite, um, uh, it's hidden in the fact that they actually not, they might have a contract, but they actually got a relationship with one person. 
Mm. What they fail to do often, SMEs fail to to penetrate larger organizations and establish mm. proper contracts, firstly. Secondly, establish pro proper relationship within the larger entities that they serve. Mm. And then, then thirdly, like you mentioned, I mean, that's a, that's a really, really good point. Often they get stuck at one or two big customers. Mm. Why? Because they can't take on any more work. And they man that becomes their ceiling is, I mean, they get very happy about the win. Like, yeah, I've got that big customer. Oh, shoot, I got that big customer because now I can't mm. do anything else. So now yeah. this, this, uh, this conundrum, you know, enters the business, they get to a certain point, a like decent turnover, decent EBITDA, the whole lot. But in fact, it's, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors. It's not really that pl uh, plain cut or plain and simple. Uh, so yeah, just tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because when I said that most companies aren't saleable, a, a large number of those are because they're reliant on a customer and depending on the margin of a customer or a business, it might be once a business has a customer that's more than say 20% of its turnover, if you, if you take the margin away from that customer, suddenly you're loss making. And that means it's, it's really difficult to acquire unless you have some kind of earn out based on, on that particular customer carrying on for the next few years. And we, we, we tried to do one of those and it didn't complete in the end. And they're, they're all, they're all pretty complex. Um, but, but the, the, the other issue, the, the other issue with that is, um, it's, a, it's a great business to own. You've got that customer, you're making lots of money and it's great, but, but not for somebody else to buy. So there's a lot of businesses, I call them income generating models where the great businesses mm. to own, but, but they're too risky for somebody else it's, to it's buy. It's lifestyle. I mean, it's a lifestyle yeah. business, isn't it? To a great extent. No, absolutely. Now the way we mitigate, the way we mitigate that and the way we mitigate, I come back to um, management, management, management. I the, the, the way we mitigate about the risks of new management versus old management, the effect of the owner going in relationships, is we um, try to make sure we only acquire or invest in businesses where the business has um, there's various ways of, of phrasing this that I use as a real purpose and it adds value to the supply chain. And quite often, if you if you look at our our portfolio of businesses, you think well. That's a really eclectic mix of businesses. However, most of them do a small part of somebody else's larger supply chain. And therefore, uh, for example, we've got a, a chemical um, manufacturer and, and the chemical in a, in a finished product might cost the customer um, 20 pound. But the chemical that, that we sell to, to the intermittent customer might cost 10 pence. So, the, so this, and the rest of it is tax, packaging, uh, freight, um, the profit of the brand owner, da, da 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 da. So there's no point in the brand owner trying to come to, to our customer and say, "Can we have it for nine pence, please?" Um, because of all the regulation and the cost of changing. So it's quite a sticky. It's quite a sticky revenue. We've got another um, business that's that's a branded manufacturer of a, of a branded product, and it's specified in in, in somebody's supply chain. So it, it's all about when you're acquiring and integrating. It's all about. Um, making sure the value is in the business and not in the people. Now, I, I come from an advisory background, which is a people business. And there's lots of people businesses out there. There's consultancies, there's lawyers, there are accountants. They are very difficult businesses to sell or acquire because a lot of the value is in those people, whether they're the work winners or the work, the, the, the doers. And that's why um, we don't acquire people businesses because they're just too difficult to acquire because your intellectual property is outside the business and, and the people. So we, we, um, we try to make sure we buy what we call real businesses. We call them boring businesses. They're not high growth businesses and therefore we're getting them at good prices to reflect that. And we're investing in businesses where we think we can add value, where we've got some kind of comparative um, advantage. So if somebody shows us a business that's a really high performing business, that's that's high growth it's unlikely to be one for us because we feel you know we can't add value and it'd be too expensive and there's other there's there's other acquirers and investors that would buy those but we like to to to, to buy um businesses that have got lots of customers the average order value is is fairly low there's a high repeat customer base and you know i, I use the, set, the the term um like a sausage machine it'll take a long time to go wrong and in that time we can transition from 
founder uh, or original owner to to new to new management that we may we may go out and headhunt. So we, it's all just like everything in business. It's about um, the the risk and reward ratio. And if you can get your risk really low, you, you, your potential rewards can come down as well. You know, you don't be you don't we're we're competing in a in a very um, small part of the private um, mm. company arena. So the EBITDAs of the businesses we're looking at are typically half a million to two million. Above that, you've got other, you know, private equity investors and mm. trade buyers who are interested. Mm. But anything be, anything below um, two million or a million, they're hard businesses to, to sell because they're not going to change the dial for a corporate investor. So I, I've, you know, in the past, I've been trying to sell businesses with an EBITDA of a million pound to companies that turn over, you know, 500 million a billion pound they're not interested it doesn't turn the dial unless unless it does something magical that they can really scale up <laughs> yeah yeah and 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 what i mean you're really sharing a whole lot of golden nuggets so you've got you've got you're building a, a winning formula which which um I'm, I'm guessing maybe you just you want to share your journey in in this winning formula so the winning formula is it comes from the initial experience of of uh, ha having that one entity that had a too big a custom. So, you, I mean, that's sort of golden nugget one, the high risk sits in and having customer concentration levels too, too high. The other golden nugget that I'm getting, and, and this is what I'm hearing you say, is that that lower value, high vo higher volume transactions tend to give you a bit of a delayed effect in terms of writing the, uh, you know the mistakes or the market changes or whatever yeah. it is you could you got time to adjust it's not too rapid so i mean that's another really good uh, point that you made there the 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 other the other thing that that that's really interesting that that the point you're making there is that in terms of your i mean you call it eclectic but it, it fits it fits within a model. I mean, if you look at the six entities that you've got, and maybe you want to just share a little bit about what they are. I don't have to give the names, but I mean, you you can you can just share how they're made up because I think together they make a, a significantly good business. Hmm. On their own, they don't necessarily do that. And and this is what we talk about, sort of the value creation or the synergy capture, all those big, you know, consulting terms that we we talk about. Tell us a bit about that mix. Mm. And I mean, it's, it, it's a steady, eddy, slow process, isn't it? It's, it's buying yeah. one, getting it right, buying another, getting it yeah. right, and so on. I mean, you're not necessarily, although you're looking at a thousand businesses a year, you're not flying out the gates and saying, we're going to buy everything that we see. So tell us a little bit about that mm. sort of philosophy, if you can. Yeah, sure. The first fund we raised in 2008 was... Um, in fact, it was it was we raised it in the same month that I think RBS and Northern Rock went bust. So it wasn't a great time to set up a fund. We raised some money from our our clients, and we we'd, we'd already got two transactions lined up. And then over the next three or four years, we invested in four others. Now they were really eclectic, and um, there was no fit whatsoever between them. We did we did well though. We we had you know two or three real winners, one or two um, not so, and we made a really good return. So on the back of that. Um, mm -hmm. We raised a larger fund that's now created these six businesses that we've now incorporated. So previously, it was a it was a typical ten year life private equity fund, and our second fund was as well. But what we realised in the second fund is we, we realised um, what what looked good and what we were good at, which was these industrial type B two B businesses. But but the issue is they take longer to. Um, get from founder ownership into into um, non non family ownership, and then to create a growth strategy. If you're in a ten year fund, you you've got to invest, grow, and exit within the ten years for for all the companies in that fund. And my view is life doesn't work in ten year circles. Life with SMEs and companies, they they might be quick in and outs, but typically they're, they're much longer. So we incorporated the fund last, early last year into a limited company called PhD Industrial Holdings. And we've got about 100 high net worth shareholders. And we said to our investors, this is what we want to do, because rather than setting up a fund, um, buying a business and then selling it and giving you the money back when you don't want it and, the, and you get taxed and then asking you for it back to do another fund, 
why don't you just keep it in the company? Because in, with a holding company, if you've got a majority share of a business, um, when you sell that company, there's no tax to pay. So our investors can leave their returns compounding tax-free over the years. And, and, I, and I know I'm going left of centre talking about tax now, but it, but it is one of, the, one of the reasons why we set the fund up. So it, it gives us more time that matches the growth of these businesses. But also it, um, the business's inheritance tax-free as well because it's a, um, a share in a, in, a, in a private company. So our investors are happy to, to leave their, their value com compounding. And I mentioned something about business to business. That's something I've, I've not mentioned earlier. Um, we've had better experience of business to business businesses than business to consumers. And what our experience has told us is that with business to business, it takes longer to get a customer. It's all about um, demonstrating to um, the customer why they should buy your, your products or service, um, what the attributes are, the aftercare, um the relationship do you trust this this buyer and you, you you know it might take months or years to build that relationship and then finally the customer the potential customer wants to talk about price but they only want to talk about price if they're happy with everything else and it takes a long time to to win a customer and it should take a long time to lose them for those very reasons they've chosen to, to use you for a reason so that's why we like business to business now I know a lot of people won't, won't agree with me, but this is my experience. With business to consumer, the reason why a consumer will buy a product from you is down to two reasons. It's typically, unless it's a brand, so that you've got some cult brands out of there. So I've, I'm on my Apple MacBook, I've got my iPad here, I've got my Apple earphones, and I've got my iPhone because I'm, I'm sold on the, 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 the iPhone cult brand. Leave that aside, most consumer businesses, it's all about the price and the weather. Now, the price, everyone will understand. Because of the internet, you can get it cheaper. Uh, you, you don't need to touch and feel it these days. You know it's going to arrive. With clothing, it's slightly different, You're, but you can send them back, so that's, that's fine. And when, whenever I say about the weather, people say, well, that's not right. And then they sit back and think, you know what? There is something in that. Because the weather affects whether you're booking a holiday, whether you're buying a jumper or an umbrella. You, you think about it. It's those two things. And whilst you're a, you're a consumer, I'm a consumer, without insulting either of us, we're very fickle. Um, and, and there's not a lot of loyalty. Apart from brand loyalty, that aside, there's not a lot of loyalty. It's about, well, can I get the product? How much is it? Can I get it here on time next day or, or, or whenever it is? And business to business is, is, is completely different. So when I see businesses like they sell mattresses in a box, I think, well, what, the, cost, the cost of the acquiring that customer is massive on Google AdWords. Now, once you've bought a, a, a new mattress, hmm. when are you going to buy another mattress? And I know that people have got more than one bed in the house, but it's only after a few. And I know the mattress company say, oh, you've got to get a new one every two years, of course. But you don't buy that many, do you? And um, we're seeing a lot of companies at the moment, uh, and I call it the COVID bounce. They've had a, a COVID, you know, bounce in sales. And a good example is is sofa businesses. So in in um, you know, we didn't buy a sofa ourselves, but most people are sat there thinking, I can't go on holiday, I can't go anywhere. I'm going to buy myself <laughs> a sofa. Once you bought a sofa, you're not going to buy one for the next five years. And that's there's a lot of businesses who've, who've made a lot of sales. Hmm. And you still can't, you know, you still can't see where they're at in, in, in the cycle. Um, hot tubs are another one. You know, people are wondering why consumer spending is going down. It's because people cannot fit any more stuff in their house at the moment. Well, I mean, if you just think of how, how quickly your house fills up when you start hmm. going on a bit of a buying spree. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that, that's, that's very interesting. The weather does, does impact. And and there's also only that much money to go around because it's mm. also wallet share. I mean, we're also looking at at uh, external ge uh, sort of geographic, geopolitical um, issues as well, supply chain, cost of living. I mean, they're calling it a crisis, but I mean, this is bound, it was bound to happen and it's just eventually happened. Mm. I mean, uh, mm. I don't think it happened pre-pandemic anyway. I think it was, it was just needed just a bit of a, <laughs> a trigger, but yeah. I mean, there, there, there's so many things, but what's, what's really evident for me is, Craig, is, is your experience in the SME space, is, is your thorough understanding of the dynamics that sit within that environment. That's that, I think you said, one to two million 
uh, space that's not necessarily interesting for a private equity or a, or a, or a let's call it a strategic corporate uh, buyer and so on. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating space, but if you think about the size of the market, that's why you're looking at a thousand deals. I think there are about 5 million odd businesses in, in the UK. Yeah. Um, you know, to look at a thousand deals is a drop in the bucket compared to the number of registered businesses, because really 70, 80% of them are sitting at that level in any case. So you're looking at an, quite a few million at the, in that space. Mm. Um, and I mean, you looking at a thousand, it sounds like a lot, but as you go lower down to the market, it, it literally just sort of explodes. Um, anything below, I think 2 million or 1.5, yeah. I think it gets even, I think below a 500,000, I think it gets even worse. worse. Yeah. But yeah. So, so I think what's evident for me is your thorough understanding of that space. And then also, also the B2B space as opposed to yeah. B2C. So I don't know if you want to just uh, expand on what I've just said. Yeah, it's interesting. I was listening to a podcast a couple of years ago and um i can't remember his name now but he was he was saying the way to make money or the way to really excel at something is to be really narrowly defined on your expertise in a particular item and his 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 go-to product was a particular rolex watch and it was also a ferrari but a ferrari between the dates of 1967 to 1972 and he was saying, look, I know nothing about Ferraris other than those dates. And I know nothing about Rolex watches apart from a, a Rolex Daytona or something between the ages of 1984 to 1989 or something like that. And what he was trying to demonstrate was, you, do, you know, you need to instill and instill and go deeper and deeper into something, you know. And I was listening to it thinking, well, what, what do I know? What am I interested in? What comparative advantage have I got? Um and then I, I thought, you know what, it, it is actually my day job. That is what I know a lot about. Because as you said, you've got millions and millions of companies out there and businesses out there. And, and uh, inadvertently, we've distilled it down to a set of broad criteria that we stick to. So those thousand companies every year, it's quite easy to go, no, no, no. Ah, yes, please, can I have the an NDA for that? And the IM, we'll have a look at that. D is it what we think? Mm. Yeah, it looks great. Oh, the, there's a customer. It's twenty percent of the of the turnover. We can't do that. Or, or actually, mm. no. It actually, looks pretty good. Let's let's do a meeting. And these days, of course, the first meetings are on Teams. Still, mm. now, I prefer to do things face to face. Before COVID, I'd never use. Well, the, the odd time I'd, I'd used I'd use Zoom Teams, but now everyone prefers it because it cuts down on time. It means you can do more in less time. And also with business owners who are selling the business, they don't want you to go to their business. It's, it's all confidential. So um, a Teams meeting it, it, it is great. But it is your proverbial, you know, hopper of all those, you know, where do you start by trying to invest in a business? You've got the whole of the UK. And in fact, you've got the whole of the world. And, we've, you know, we just, in, we, just, um, we just acquire in the UK because language, um, distance and all that kind of stuff. And even though we can do things online, we wouldn't invest um, in, in Europe. We'd buy a European business as a subsidiary of an existing one, but not as a, a standalone investment. So you come down to all, to all, to all these, um, a smaller subset. And the way we get to that subset is, well, which companies are actually for sale? Because another strategy you could have is, well, let's do some research and, and the internet's up, you know, fantastic. Let's do, a, a, let's do some research about companies that are out there that do things that we want to uh, invest in. But the problem there is most of them will not be for sale. And I'm making numbers up. It might be 49 out of every 50 are not for sale in that sector. So what's the point approaching 50 um, or thousands just to, just to find one, one or two? So it's easier to – our, our approach is actually – to wait for people to approach us with companies for sale because at least we know the owner wants to sell and that is 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 half of the half of the problem really we've we've tried approaching companies before and it's great because the, you know you have a conversation with them and say well mm. actually time is not right at the moment and then you know five years later they'll have kept your letter or your your, your email and they'll ring you up and that, and that's that's fine you can also reduce the odds of course by searching for directors who are, who are of a particular age uh, but it, it, it's more laborious that because uh, is the son in the business? Is he going to sell to his, hand it down and all that kind of stuff? So we just keep things simple. 
And, um, you know, we've put a lot of time and effort into making connections with people who sell companies such that every day I get, you know, a handful of emails with, with companies for sale. And, and that's how you get the thousand a year. So it, it sound, as you said, it, it sounds a lot, but it actually over a year, it's, it's not that many. And, it, you know, say a thousand, if you distill it down to the number a day, actually, it's probably 2000. But it, it's quick to get rid of the ones that, that don't fit our criteria. I think I think the critical thing there for me is is with that amount of experience, knowledge, and understanding, already having a base of of acquired entities, having gone through potentially a few learning steps as well, learning a um, few potholes that you probably stripped into, but you, you get smarter. I think that's what you were saying. You get you get better at at the selection. So 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 if we if we sort of switch into sort of integration mode, mm. and we say. If I'm if I'm selecting my acquired business, if I'm selecting it based on a set of criteria, knowing what the outcome is going to be, knowing what my recipe, and I'm just putting that out there. I don't know if you do have a recipe, but knowing what the process will be once I've acquired them, knowing what my process is to get the acquisition. But once I've signed the deal, what I need to do to to make sure I secure that that asset because. It doesn't help I've gone through a thousand or two thousand no's, whittled it down to two or three, four entities that look interesting, having those endless conversations. I mean, I've, I've had conversations in Costa coffee shops and I mean, you, you know, in up in the weirdest of places and these kids flying around and, you know, and, and you just, you just can't even have a proper conversation yet. You can't go and see the actual business and you have no idea what you're really buying. So a lot of it's on faith and a lot of it is on, on gut feel and instinct. So, I mean, that's, that, that's sort of what I'm, what I'm sensing. And, and, but you get, you get that out of really hard earned experience, but also just knowing your market, knowing your niche. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, they say, what's it? The, the Americans say the riches on the niches, you know, I don't know if that means anything to you, but, but it's basically niching it down, knowing yeah. what you're good at, knowing what you're not good at. And I think that's probably even more important than, than knowing what yeah. you're good at, but then also yeah. to have a plan, I would imagine to go forward and having had this conversation with you prior to the podcast as well, just expand a bit on that. So now you've made mm. a selection, what happens next? Yeah. So we've we found something we want to acquire. We've agreed the price. We do a, an amazing amount of due diligence, financial, legal, uh, operational property, you name it. So Whilst we may have only had a look around the business once physically, we've spent a lot of time with the owner. We, we've hopefully spent time with the management team as well. Mm -hmm. But the due diligence will really go into so much depth to throw, throw up um, potential issues, but, but actually potential opportunities as well. So we, 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 we do know, what, whilst I talked about leap of faith, there's always going to be that leap of faith that, that these days is, is you know, gut feel, you know, it's a small amount. Most of it is, is probably more scientific. And then, and then you acquire it. Um, and the, the improvements we think we can make, as I say, we, we make sure that the profit and the cash generation of the business we are acquiring will not go backwards. That's our first, that's our first thing. And we think by doing some some relatively simple things, we can maintain that and and grow it and get it a better quality income as well. So mm. to start a business up and get to a turnover of five million is very difficult to do, and that's where your entrepreneurs come in and build it to five million. Or, or I, I know we read about people who get it up to hundreds of millions, but let's let's talk about our market our market space, and it, and it might take twenty years. And that's another thing. We'll only invest in a business that's been going for a, a long time. So the average life of our six businesses is probably is probably twenty to thirty years. It's maybe more actually. So the the the, the, the proven they're not they're not just started up and you know they're, they're proven over a, um, a a number of years. Now what we do the 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 relatively easy win the two wins we normally get one is we'll probably um, bring some better financial um, metrics to it, so that so that the, the the people in the business have got a better appreciation of 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 what affects margin and pricing and, and ultimately the bottom line. So th th there's a bit of that we can we can bring to it, and also the confidence to say, well, hang on a second, I know that's your major customer, 
but his their margin is a lot lower than the others. So why do we go back and increase prices, which is always a tough one? But we give the management teams the uh, we, we empower them and give them the confidence to do that. Uh, there are risks. The customer could say, "Well, I'm walking away." But the business is going going back full circle. The businesses we're investing in have pricing power. There's a, there's a reason for being, and the and the the, the income's pretty sticky. So we're quite confident that. Uh, again, based on experience, the customers will take those those price increases. So that's one side of it. And the second side of it, and, and also you can lump into their um, better systems and, you know, you, you talk about ERP, ERP, better reporting systems, um, and IT systems as well. Mm-hmm. The other part of it is just unleashing the business from the business owner because the business owner, as I said, typically he's taking it from zero to five million. He's set it up in his... 30s he's into his late 50s 60s or, or what and I apologies for being ageist but at that time of life and I, you know I'm that kind of age as well but I've not got that attitude at the moment people want to take it easier and therefore they're not willing to take the business risks that got them from zero to five so we think well if that person semi-retires or steps back and and the next the next tier of management team come through or indeed we bring somebody else in to supplement the management team they're incentivized to grow it from 5 million to 10 or 15 or 20 and that's what we do we 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 heavily incentivize um our management teams with with equity so we pay them fairly and well as well but but really they can make some really tax efficient money by growing the value of the business from the, the point we invest to 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 up here and and it's those it's those two things. It's it, it it it's in the margin, but it's also getting the right people involved as well. They've got the right experience from from outside the company rather than the self grown um, business owner. Yeah, and and just maybe just to add to that, and and this is what I, mean, I think you and I touched on this in our previous conversation was, um, when you're going into a business, you you're looking for somebody that. Has potentially got no sales and marketing really he relies yeah. he or she and i'm you know I'm, I'm you know i don't want to be gender specific but but you have you have this situation where the owner has got comfortable in terms of you know just living off their reputation potentially or just because they there they've got a bunch of mates they've been doing business with for a while so they work off what they call word of mouth that i love when i hear that because then I absolutely know there's huge leverage there to be to be had. Um, and often um, I've also seen, and I want to add this in and, and then just get your, your view on it. I've seen the, the longer that the owner has been in the business, the older they are, the less they've increased their prices mm. over the years. So they've progressively, their prices have actually gone down. Mm. If you look at market conditions, New companies are charging much higher margins, giving exactly the same or maybe a slightly different service, having much better sales and marketing. I mean, the the, the gains are massive. If you get the, mm. select the right entity, uh, tell me about that. Yeah, it, it is all it is all about pricing power and the ability to to push those prices onto onto customers. And you know, quite often we'll put that uh, give that empowerment to the management teams. And it, and it will lead to losing some customers at the lower end, but they're, they're actually not contributing. So we may as well get a better margin from, from 90% of the customers than lower margin from them and, and, you know, and, and lose that, te- that 10% or whatever. And, you, and you're right, Dully. The, the third aspect that I, that I forgot about what makes a business attractive is that they've grown up on the back of their current customer base and being successful in the, in the past, and they've not invested in sales and marketing because they haven't had to they don't need to they're making they're making they're making 800,000 600,000 clear profit a year in in dividends between uh, one two four people why why try and employ somebody on a on a fancy salary who's unproven because um the feedback you'll get from business owners is oh uh, sales people always over promise and under deliver and that's you know that's probably true they sell themselves very well in interviews um whereas we've got a different outlook in that we're acquiring a business here we want to grow it to here how do we do that well we need to invest in people so 
and most of the businesses we invest in, they're very cap capex light. We don't like businesses that might make a million pound profit, but they spend 300 every year in new capex and they've got to keep doing that. We, we need to make sure that they're generating proper cash. But our investment normally comes in in terms of people. So if a business is selling a, a product and it's sold it for, for forever, which other customers could it sell to? Which other territories could it sell into? Which, which other complementary? It, it, you know, it's it's, um, it's it's typical and soft matrix stuff. It's textbook stuff. You know that, that we we try and instill in a business and say, okay, how can we get into that territory? How can we get into those customers? Well, well, let's employ somebody to do it. Let, uh, let's look at agents. Let's look at let's use a headhunter to find somebody from the sector. Let let's just let's just have a look because a lot of business owners are very inwardly focused in that you know that's what they're doing that's what they're doing that's worked well but actually if we can just bring some you know helicopter view on other things we've seen and that's another that's another point you you picked up on um before dudley about um now you know we've got six businesses and, and the more focus there is between them the more they can cross share ideas and expertises because our businesses, they turn over between 3 million and 20 million turnover. You know, they're, they're not they're not massive companies, but they're quite sizable private companies. And they've all got high performing management teams. And it's a shame that each one has got a high performing management team. So what if you get them all in the same room, proverbial room, or, or get them cross fertilizing ideas in terms of how they buy or how they sell and the routes to market. And suddenly you get, you know, the, the, the sum of the parts, uh, the, the whole is bigger than the, bigger than the sum of the parts. Yeah. And I, and I think that's, if, if you look from a, from a, a management team's perspective, uh, it, it, there's a, it, there's a sense, and I'm not sure if it, if, it, if it's real or not, but there, for me, there's always a sense that if I'm part of a bigger group, there's a bit of a safety net. Uh, there's someone, there's a sounding board. There's someone I can bounce things off, um, because if you if you think about an SME on their own, it's a it's a very lonely world. Mm. If you've got a management team that's part of a bigger group, and you have NEDs like yourself with massive experience mm. and and all the knowledge and understanding, you could get people working together, and and you know people working together just bring a much better result at, at the end of the day. So I'm loving your formula. Yeah, it is massive, actually. That's another good point you make because we're getting these high-performing people out of other businesses. So if, if it's um, – mo most of the businesses we invest in don't have a finance director because the owners don't value what a finance director does. So we say, let's bring a finance director in. Inevitably, they will either be from a, a, a big four or they'll be from a bigger organization that they're part of. And we're asking them to go into a smaller SME as the number one finance people person so it does help them knowing there's there's five other people who they can just call on and our F, our group F, fd as well and it's the same thing with the with the managing directors as well i think they like the fact that there's the, as well as us the, the the three or four of us as, as, as neds across the group they've also got access to the five other people now mm -hmm. um not all of them will be as relevant as others but they'll strike up some really good um, relationships and you know hopefully friendships with with two or three of those other managing directors because we all know of course that being the the managing director or the owner of a business is the most lonely place because there's never quite anyone on your on your par um, now we try and create um, part. We, we we use the word partnership, but we work in partnership a lot with the management teams. But we 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 quite we see it at the core of a management team as a partnership themselves, and it's typically managing director and finance director. Now there might also be a sales um, director, there might be an operations director, mm -hmm. there might be some other type of director. But all our companies will have a managing director and a finance director. And that's, that's often the core team. And that's because of um, the managing director is typically sales and marketing and operations and everything. Uh, and, and he's got a lot of direct reports. And fi why do we help hold finance directors in so high regard? Because of that first leg of our strategy, it, 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 you know, price, uh, um, maximizing in margin and pricing. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm loving that. I, I mean, in, uh, if you've ever done, um, scuba diving and that we call that's the buddy system, you know, you oh, always yeah. go down yeah, yeah. underwater with a buddy. You don't do it alone. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. You know, work with somebody and, and make sure there's someone, you know, on the surface that can, that can yeah. 
pull you up if you're in trouble or whatever yeah. it is. So, and I think it's almost that kind of analogy, isn't it? It's mm. it's a buddy system. Go in and do your whatever you're going to do under the water, mm. Uh, mm. but you know you've got a backup system. The NED is mm. on the surface, but you also have your your accountability or your buddy that's mm. working with you uh, mm. in, on the journey, which is a totally different dynamic. And 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 I'm sure the employees of the companies of the target companies feel feel better they feel more confident they probably feel there's a growth path for them career-wise I'm, I'm just making assumptions mm -hmm. but if all of a sudden they're part of a bigger group mm. it's it's they want to go to work it's not oh you know so and so uh the owners today having a bad day is now moaning at everyone because mm. nobody's done any work oh just hopefully monday is not going to be the same mm. you know it's, it's that kind of dynamic is almost taken out completely uh, and now you've created this, this this bigger organism. Let's call it an improved organism. Mm. Um, in, in way, I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, people don't like change, do they? So when they read, when they get a press release internally memo that says we've now been sold and taken over, obviously that's a really worrying time. Nobody likes change. What we say to people is, what we say to business owners and the and the employees is that. Um, we, it's a bit like one of those, uh, is it Philip Patak uh, watches? The advert says you never actually um, own one. You just look after it for the next generation. And that's what <laughs> we say about businesses. We might not yeah. own it forever, but hopefully under our stewardship, we will, we will improve it. Now, if a business is sold to um, a strategic, I call them trade buyers, that's mm -hmm. a big risk for employees because they could just strip the heart and soul out of the business. They could consolidate, you know, warehousing and sales and marketing, all sorts of things. With us, we invest in a business where there's a proven business model and we don't fix something that's not broken. We may acquire and bolt things on. We may encourage the, the, the management teams, you know, to, to grow organically. And that's great, great for everyone. But the business will stay autonomous, albeit... It will be under PhD IH's um, ownership. So I think all stakeholders like it in terms of um, the vendors like it because it's a good story uh, to, to their employees in the outside outside world. The management teams like it when they're talking to um, customers and suppliers. And employees like it because there's, there's, um, there's, tr there's transparency. Whereas previously under um, a private equity ownership, everyone knows it's only 10 years and you've got to sell it. And therefore, it's just like a, a holding period, where, whereas we can keep our businesses forever if we want and just and just a bit like um, Warren Buffett's um, Berkshire Hathaway, in, you know, in some respects, it takes so long to find a good business and so long to create that growth strategy with the management team. Why mm. then be pressured to sell it two years later just because you're, you're in a 10 year private equity fund? And, and you know, most of the. Most of the UK businesses are either owned by uh, they're owned by business owners themselves. They're either publicly listed, which obviously isn't that many, but it's a, or they're or they're owned by you know the, the public sector. And then you've got ones that are owned by private equity. And then you've got you've got some investment vehicles as well, like ours. But there's not that many. Uh, I c I could only name th three others that I've really come across. Um, Interestingly, there's there's more cropping up which are quoted on the um, Scandinavian stock markets. They're realising it, it, it's a good way of creating shareholder value by putting similar synergistic businesses together, albeit keeping them autonomous, so they can be sold if they if they want to. So we do sell our businesses, um, we, but we'll only sell a, we'll only sell one of our businesses if somebody approaches us and says we need your business for strategic reasons. Therefore, we're going to pay you. A small fortune we'll you know we'll do we'll do that um or if one of the stakeholders says actually we'd like to sell now which might be the the, the management team or um or a founder shareholder who's still got an investment um you know we'll, we'll go in with an agreed strategy we might hold something for three years five years or it might mm -hmm. be 20 years but it's all about having that um transparency the relationship the communication and also people what people people want to do changes over the years whether it's family ill health or just want to do something else so it's got to be it's, it's quite formulaic but it's it's also got to have an element of flexibility in it as well for the whole structure to to work i love it i mean i just it's just i could speak to you for hours i want to I want to quickly switch gears and go to um 
uh, inaugural Northwest Insider Awards. You were voted Corporate Finance Advisor of the Year and Deal Maker of the Year in Lancashire. Tell me a bit about that because the reason why I'm asking is what's what's evident to me. And I mean, I've, I've, I think I first met you and your team quite some time ago. I don't know, it must be a, I don't know, must be a year ago now already. Mm -hmm. um, if I think what is the real value in what you are creating is really the the team of the three or four of you NEDs. You are the real management team. You've got you creating something of serious value. And I think that is the special, the magic, magic uh, dust or fairy dust or whatever they want to call it, that you've managed to create a formula that, that works. You've managed to create the filter to filter out all the things that, don't, that aren't going to suit you as a group. Um, it might work for someone else, but for you as a group, you found your, your, your method of working together. And, and this, I think that's probably for me where it's all coming. So I want to go to those, um, to those awards, if you can quickly share that mm. and then just come back to where I think the real value in, in what you have created as a, as a group is probably sitting at the NED level. Um, although you do have strong teams and that, and you've, you, you've applied a lot of the principles. But sure. in order to really grow, I mean, if I look at 65 million, you probably be 165 in a few years and then 300, then 500. And next thing you see, you're in a different, a different ball game. You know, you're going to have to bring in more, pe mm. <laughs> more yeah. people to support you and you have to systemize a lot of the things that you're doing yourself. Mm. So, okay, let's go back to the award. And then I want you to maybe just talk a bit about your company. I want you to sort of punch your company a bit and say, look, what kind of investable people are you looking for? Sure. I don't know if it's investors, but I think you're looking more for companies to buy. Mm. But uh, let's start at the awards and then end up at, at, at the nice, um, yeah. you know, tell us what you want, what you're looking yeah, for. Yeah, I don't always put that on my bio because these days it doesn't really mean much. But back then, going back 20 years, it was one of the, you know, the first awards uh, it was only Lancashire, um, which is past the Northwest, which is past the, the UK. So it's, so it's only Lancashire, but it was quite pleasing to get both of both of the the corporate mm. finance and dealmaker awards it, it, the first time they've been run in Lancashire. And Lancashire is full of great great professionals. So these days, you know, there's on LinkedIn, there's there's award after award after award. So it's, it doesn't sound that great now, but but back then, it, you know, it was something. So I'm proud of that. And in terms of the team and what we're creating, um, we, 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 you know, we're having a, a, a debate at the moment. What are we actually, you know, what are we doing? Are we just growing a collection of assets that's worth as much as we can get it for the benefit of our shareholders? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. But are we trying to create a legacy um, formula that, that, that can be passed down to other people to ca carry on growing it? So, you know, if we, if we get this to 100 million, 200, 500, who knows? Yes, the 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 the, the capital value is um, uh, interesting. How you get paid is interesting, but 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 it comes to a point where it's creating a, a legacy. So it'd be nice to create a legacy that you know in twenty years, thirty years, it's 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 still go, going, and, and we created that, and we were part of that. But but the reason the reason why I think we're successful, we've made mistakes in the past, and we've learned from those, and hopefully the mistakes will get less, and we've been through all that. But but the, the thing that that is making us successful at the moment is the is is the passion to 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 do it and the mm -hmm. dynamics and the teamwork and the friendships uh, amongst our group as well of, of of fellow investors. You know, there's a handful of us, and um, I often used to say to people, I've never really had a proper job because I was just an advisor um, and and then doing some in, investing in NED work, and now I guess mm -hmm. I am a full time executive director of a company. So it is a real job, actually, albeit in a way it's not, because the, the real hard work is what the management teams are doing with their individual businesses, dealing with their customers and suppliers. But I guess it is a real job because we're dealing with we're dealing with, with investors. We're dealing with I mean, our stakeholders are different. Um, the people who are buying businesses off. Um, they, they become they become shareholders, possibly. Um, so it's not your typical stakeholder um, analysis. Um, but what we're what we're looking for, we're, we're looking to increase our investor base. As I said, we've, we've got about 100 high net worth um, in, investors, so we're always looking to increase our investor ba base because um, it's fine investing in a private company that's growing, but how do you actually get out of it? So we, we have dealing days every six months where 
where we as directors say, look, we think the net asset value is this. Do any of our shelves want to sell any of their shares or all of their shares? And also, do we know any investors, either existing ones or new ones, who want to buy into the journey as well? Because ultimately, we want to increase the value of the, the company and increase the shareholder base as well. And of course, as you alluded to, Dudley, um, the other thing we want is, is, um, is, is to be introduced to, to more companies who want to be part of our journey as well, where the shareholders um, don't necessarily want to sell out fully because you, you can actually sell to, to somebody. It might not be for the right price, but you can always sell. Whereas we say, well, you know, what, what should be important to somebody who's looking to sell should be time, i.e. Um, time out of the business because you've been working 24 seven for 30 years. But that doesn't mean you want to get out of the business completely. You might want to just drop down your days. You might want to just become non-executive chairman. And you still might want to be an investor in the business. Because, of course, if you sell your business these days, what do you do with your cash? Where do you put it? What do you do with it? Where, why not leave some invested in a business that you know full well is a good business and, and should go on to, to, to greater things? I love it. And I, and I, I think what I, what I would potentially like to see more of are, are owner or owner founders and, and people that are looking at exit to to stop looking at the the business that they've built as an extension of themselves mm -hmm. which they often do they get very sentimentally attached to it but rather think of it as again the custodian i think you still spoke about that that you know this is not i'm not going to be here forever i'm the one that's running out of time mm -hmm. um it's the business can carry on for as however long it you know it, it it's it's relevant in the market but if it, it, it the thing that i would like to see and, and 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 something that guys like you can actually do um is to say how do we get owner entrepreneurs or owner founders to have multiple exits now how about how about join a company like yours go on a three or five or ten year journey and grow it to another size you've still got an equity stake but you've brought in the right kind of people to take you, then take some more money off the table and do another exit mm. and then do yeah. another exit. You know, you don't have to, you know, it's not the end and it's not a retirement day. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think a lot of uh, owner founders or owner entrepreneurs should say, you know, after 10, 15, maybe even five years, I should start saying, all right, what can I do to, to start, start doing a rotation in terms of ownership because mm. i can only take it to a certain level yeah. unless my goal is lifestyle you know i want the boat i want the house i want the beach home mm. I, you know whatever it is that 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 makes them happy but once you've got that stuff it's like mm. there's not mm. not much more than that i mean you can only have that many pina coladas on yeah. some beach somewhere and then mm. what so why don't yeah. you think about the passion, your love, your love, your your uh, purpose sits within the business that you've so lovingly grown over twenty mm. or thirty years. Stay in it, yeah. but stay in it at a, a lower value. But realize mm. that you've got limitations. Bring That's teams right. like yourself in. Mm. Say, okay, come in. Let's grow mm. this thing bigger. I want to have another exit, but now mm. I want to sit in a different role. I want to mm. enjoy my life again. I want to refine a new a new career or a new journey for myself and and i think there should be gaps and people should start doing that earlier i think people yeah. should start doing it in their late 30s and 40s already i mean by the time you're in your 40s you probably had that business 15 years mm -hmm. and i've got this saying and 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 you may or may not have heard it but where often you have a someone that's had a business for 30 years they've, they've had the business for a year repeated 30 times because mm -hmm. they probably haven't actually done anything to it from the time they started they they did a few things they've got a mm. few customers it's take it's been very very hard to get it to one two three four five million whatever it is but they've done pretty much the same thing mm. they've just repeated it mm. and then they stopped because they can't mm. they, they have no further skill or assistance or they just can't see that there's bigger scope i, I don't know i'm mm. i'm 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 just sort of trying to prompt you to finish off the conversation on a sort of yeah. a high note here and, and, and no, it's a, it's a good go. point. We encourage business owners to have a minority stake, one, to keep them interested and two, to help them get further value in the future. Um, and secondly, what we've not done at the moment, but, but, um, 
selling shareholders can do. They can also buy a stake in the holding company if they believe in the whole the whole journey. That's not happened yet, but it will do, where people actually swap their minority stakes for a stake in the holding company. Or um, internal investors who've got a business that doesn't fit with our criteria, there's nothing stopping them saying, you know what, I've got my business here and I'm keeping my business or I'm selling it to, to somebody else. But actually, I like the journey you're going on because I think I can add value to some of your group companies because I, I understand that industry. I can open some doors and um, and they become like more interactive shareholders as opposed to yeah, anybody can buy uh, shares in, in a quoted investment trust or a public company. But it's very difficult to buy shares in a private investment trust like, like we've got. Mm. So... I think we should do we should do more um, we, more marketing on that to people to open the um, the shareholder base ultimately. Mm. I, I think so. I think I think you're on some on a winning path, and I th I'm not sure how it's going to change. But uh, as I said when we just before we went live, I'd like to, to you to come on online again. Um, you know, as as you build out on what you're doing, I think yeah. it's an amazing journey you're on. Uh, I think you've you've narrowed it down absolutely brilliantly, and and I just 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 want to say say thank you, um, thank you for joining us today, Craig. No, thank you. I've really it's enjoyed it. It, uh, it. it it's it's amazing how much you actually get out of it by sharing your story, and it makes makes you think because you 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 start thinking about things a different way. So thank you. Enjoyed it. Yeah. So 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 stay on the line. I was going to say goodbye to the audience, um, and let me just change the screen there we go and thank you everyone for for joining us today on our 100 days and beyond um uh podcast where we've we had an amazing uh, craig richardson from uh from uh Dara schofield watts um i think absolutely brilliant phd uh I, I'm, I'm going to put the link in the in in, in the chat in the bio please get hold of him uh, there are multiple things that you can be doing. Have a conversation. I think it's well worth it. Uh, and the, the wealth of experience is, is, is absolutely brilliant. I think it's different uh, kind of guest to what you may be used to. This is in the SME space. So thank you for, for, for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to you on our next uh, episode. And this is true, um, I would say, in the trenches integration because this is buying a, an SME and buying the right one and then doing the right things to then create um, a, a value. It may not be a merged value, but it's definitely an integrated value. But thank you very much for joining us today. And we look forward to, you, forward to having you on our next episode of 100 Days and Beyond. Thank you and goodbye. Hi, everybody. This is Dudley again. And if you need help with a future or existing post-merge integration, I want to invite you to arrange a free, no obligation meeting with us. During the meeting, we'll find out exactly what you need, what your challenges are, and we'll explain how our unique PMI slipstream method can help you. Simply call us or visit mergerintegration.co.uk. That's mergerintegration.co.uk or come to our website, skillfulpursuit.com.